All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started with this week's Grand Rounds Conference. Uh, we've got a wonderful presentation for you guys today. We've got our CME code in the top left, so just make note if you need to claim CME credit. I'd like to start off by introducing our speaker today. Dr. Aaron Gorodesky is a cardiologist and the section head of the section of Advanced Heart Failure in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. He's an associate professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Gorodesky earned his Bachelor of Arts degree at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, graduating magna cum laude. He received his medical doctorate from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, where he was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor, Honor Medical Society. He completed a Master of Public Health degree with a concentration in quantitative methods at Harvard University. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and his cardiovascular disease and advanced heart failure and cardiac transplantation training at Cleveland Clinic here in town. He was a staff cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic from 2010 to 2019. Dr. Gorodesky has an interest in the medical management of patients with advanced heart failure, including outpatient, inpatient, and critical care. He is a clinical expert in cardiac transplantation and left ventricular assist devices, uh, and including management of LVADs. Dr. Gorodesky has published extensively in areas related to heart failure care transitions and the care of older adults with heart failure. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gorodesky. Thank you so much. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak at Grand Rounds today. Uh, in many ways, it's a homecoming. I've been back to uh, UH and Case now for about nine months. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. I was a med medical student here, and Dr. Armitage probably doesn't remember me, but he wrote me a letter when I was a medical student. So thank you. And it, it worked. You still have a discharge summary for AI. Dis discharge summary, right. right. I'll, I'll work on that right after the lecture, Dr. Armitage. So... Um, uh, I, I'd like to, to start, and what I'm going to be sharing today is really a personal journey of, um, uh, of the last decade of things I've been interested in, have done research with. Uh, they may or may not relate to heart failure. I'll let you guys determine that. But l let me start with, let me start with uh, 2011. I was uh, junior staff, just, just hired, just started my job as a cardiologist, uh, one year out of fellowship, and I was the medical director of a heart failure readmissions program that we called Heart Care at Home. In uh, 2011, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about readmissions risk and uh, potential interventions for these kind of patients. And I'll start off introducing Mr. EJ, who at the time was 81 years old, African-American man from the Cleveland area, and he had been diagnosed with cardiac amyloidosis and as a result had stage C heart failure. And I met him when he was hospitalized for heart failure. Uh, he had a prior hospitalization for heart failure in the prior year, and he lived alone in his apartment. As part of his evaluation in the hospital, what our um, care transitions program did was um, we, uh, we, we did a test called the MINICOG, and the MINICOG involves asking patients to recall three words and then to draw a clock. Uh, Mr. EJ was able to recall one out of three words, and I'll let you take a minute to look at this clock that he drew. We asked him to draw a clock that was 20 minutes after eight, but this is what he came up with. And what this means and why, we'll come back to it in this talk in just a minute. But um, no different now in 2020 than we were in 2011. We were standing there scratching our heads knowing for sure Mr. EJ is going to get readmitted. And um, that, was, that was the dilemma then, and that's the dilemma now. Between 2010 and 2013, we, we initiated our team at the clinic, a, this heart failure care transitions program. The goal was to reduce readmissions. We called the program um, Heart Care at Home, and this was a combination program where we provide a telehealth monitoring of vital signs and also care coordination for the patients both in the hospital and then as they transitioned out to the community. Here, are, here was the, 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 the makeup of the team. There were medical and uh, nursing administrative staff. Our clinical team was composed of a nurse practitioner who did home visits 
and she was specialized in, in care of uh, patients with heart failure. We had an inpatient transitional care team. We had two nurses who identified patients in the hospital, saw them, and started the intervention in the hospital. A home transitional care liaison who traveled to patients' home right after discharge and installed some equipment in the home, and also a telehealth team that tracked patients for about a month after discharge. We uh, also hired an inventory person and an analyst, so quite a robust team. And here, in fact, is their photograph, a lot of, a lot of old familiar friends. So here's what we did for our hard care at home model. Our inpatient liaison identified the patient in the hospital, introduced the program, and began, began a coaching intervention. After the patient was discharged, our home liaison visited the patient's home, continued the same coaching intervention, and then installed this telehealth equipment. And then our team for a period of a month monitored, provide, provided ongoing coaching. So coaching was kind of a central theme that continued from the hospital and out. Care coordination and then tracked outcomes. Uh, our nurse practitioner provided oversight, especially for sicker patients and those approaching end of life. There was physician input from myself and another medical director, and we tracked outcomes very closely. How could this not succeed, right? We had all the people. We had a perfect plan. We had equipment. We had money. For sure this was going to succeed. It, it could not fail. So... Let me uh, show you some data about the program. Here are, here is the volume of the of the program, and our goal um, was to take care of patients for about a month. We had an active daily census down here. It doesn't transmit very well, but it starts off in January 2012, February 2012, and onward month by month. And you can see that we have we had an active daily census of somewhere between 40 and 60 patients at any one time that we were tracking and delivering care for. This uh, graph shows the time from hospital discharge until we started monitoring. Uh, these are box plots, and on average, our goal was to try to get to the patient's home within one or two days, and as you can see, we succeeded. On average, we got there between one and two days. This is the enrollment duration for the patients, and patients were, as per our goal, enrolled for about 30 days. The line right there here is the median. So, so far, everything looks good. We got the patients in the program. We got to their house quickly, and they stayed in our program for the required amount of time. This graph shows that patients loved our program. Um, we looked at the HCAPS question number 19, which was, during this hospital stay, did doctors, nurses, or other hospital staff talk with you about whether you would have the help you need when you left the hospital? And those patients who were enrolled in our program, Heart Care at Home, were much more likely to, to, say, to say yes. This gave us a sense of higher levels of engagement. This graph is a bit complex, but it's important. It talks about reasons why patients were readmitted to the hospital. And I'm going to show you carefully that this graph also gives us a hint as to why our program was bound to fail. So blue are those patients who were admit, readmitted to the hospital in an emergent fashion for non-cardiovascular causes. Green are emergent admissions to the hospital for other cardiovascular causes unrelated to heart failure, so myocardial infarction or atrial fibrillation. And then in red are those patients who were emergently readmitted to the hospital for heart failure. So, you know, here we are. We're running a heart failure readmissions reduction program. And the patients are not following the rules because only a minority of them are getting readmitted for heart failure. A majority of them are coming in for reasons completely unrelated. Uh, and, of course, our program is not designed for that, so we weren't ready for that. And yet that was happening. So there's already a hint right there as to why our program would not do very well. And... Um, I have a master's degree in public health, and I love Kaplan-Meier plots, so we tracked outcomes using Kaplan-Meier plots. We drew these plots showing the time from hospital discharge to readmission, and you can see that quarter after quarter, instead of our outcomes improving, our outcomes were actually getting worse. 2012, quarter three, quarter four, 2013. Quite disappointing. 
So what went wrong? Before I, I answer that question, let me remind everybody where we were back in 2009, 2010, 2011, and what kind of led to our program even happening and getting funded. So back then in the late 2000s, 2010, 2011, there was increased discussion about the cost of hospital readmissions. And MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, released a report that year around that time estimating that CMS spends about $26 billion per year on readmissions of Medicare beneficiaries. And they estimated that $17 billion per year of that $26 billion were on return trips that did not need to happen. And in 2010, Medicare published this website uh, which was a public reporting website for hospital readmissions called, called Hospital Compare. This really turned up the heat on hospitals um, with the thought that maybe we could do something to reduce readmissions. Um, our program, Heart Care at Home, was inspired by the assumption that readmissions reductions programs need to be, need to be centered around specific conditions. So uh, the trend at the time, those who recall what was happening a decade ago, was that our professional societies, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, the Heart Failure Society of America, they held sessions titled, How Do We Reduce Heart Failure Readmissions? And probably other societies held sessions like, How Do We Reduce Pneumonia Readmissions? Or How Do We Reduce you know, uh, Myocardial Infarction Readmissions? Uh, and the under underlying assumption here is that each specific condition and the subsequent hospital readmission had a common denominator. We just assumed that that was the case. A couple of years later, Dr. Krumholtz from Yale published this data in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and what we see here is um, on the y-axis percent of patients and on the x-axis are various conditions. Amongst patients who were originally admitted for heart failure, only 37% get readmitted because of heart failure. COPD, only 36% get readmitted for COPD. Pneumonia, it's even lower. Only 29% get readmitted for, 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 for pneumonia, meaning that a majority of patients, regardless of the disease for which they were originally admitted, are getting readmitted for other causes. And yet here we are in heart care at home, right? We're, we're, we're monitoring people's weight and we're trying to figure out what heart failure component is going to lead them to get readmitted. This led to further discussions in the literature, and now it's becoming uh, more and more clear that interventions targeted at specific diseases responsible for only a fraction of all 30-day readmissions may be less efficacious. And that, in many ways, is what we were seeing with heart care at home. Jump ahead now to 2018. Um, there was this white paper published by the Heart Failure Society of America that was suggesting that maybe the solution was making, you know, uh, the problem even worse. Um, this was, let me see if I can zoom in here. I want to show you a couple of things. So take a look at this um, study called BHF. So BHF was a study, uh, a health coaching, telephone calls with monitoring of weight, blood pressure, heart rate, and symptoms in a high-risk population. Sounds pretty similar to heart care at home. So this randomized clinical trial showed uh, it failed, and um, it, it suggested that maybe non-adherence was the primary limitation with only 60% of patients um, adherent in the first 30 days. So could that have been a problem with our intervention? Maybe. Look at this Mayo Clinic study. Um, this was a telemonitoring in primary care panel of patients with heart failure. Um, they uh, monitored blood pressure, heart rate, weight, pulse ox, and daily symptoms. And this was really interesting. This study also failed. Abnormal telehealth data directed to primary care providers. It, it is unclear what action this drove. It might have caused the primary care provider to direct the patient to an emergency department or the hospital. Could increased symptom surveillance actually increase healthcare utilization? Very interesting. This white paper ultimately recommended that routine use of external remote patient monitoring is not recommended. 
for patients hospitalized for heart failure transitioning out to the community. What I want to argue now is that a requirement to reduce readmissions is to take care of the patient and not just the disease. And in many ways, that was the lesson that we learned back then with Heart Care at Home, our failed program. During hospitalization, patients are commonly deprived of sleep, experience disruption of normal circadian rhythms, are nourished poorly, have pain and discomfort, confront a baffling array of mentally challenging situations, receive medications that can alter cognition and physical function, and become deconditioned by bed rest or inactivity. Each of these perturbations can adversely affect health and contribute to substantial impairments during the early recovery period, an inability to fend off disease and susceptibility to mental error. This is what our patients are going through, and yet here we are in hard care at home. We're monitoring people's pulse and weight. And we're surprised that they're getting readmitted. Maybe we were just fooling ourselves. So here are some lessons learned from our failed program. And maybe it wasn't failed. Maybe the lessons were valuable. Uh, but at least it failed to reduce readmissions. So we ended up closing the program electively uh, in 2013 because of uh, a lack of convincing evidence that we were achieving our goal of reducing readmissions. We had employed 14 to 15 full-time employees to run hard care at home. Uh, it was costing us between $500,000 and $600,000 a year uh, to run this program. Uh, and at the time, and also now, there, no, no, there was no direct fee-for-service reimbursement for our program. In our quote-unquote heart failure program, most readmissions were unrelated to heart failure. Uh, more frequently, we struggled issues relating to multimorbidity, challenges in self-care, uh, patients approaching end of life, and complex psychosocial situations were much more of an issue than anything related to heart failure. Um, we saw that amongst patients who were monitored in our program, sometimes we would pick up on signals in the telemonitoring that actually led our nursing team to direct the patient to the ER. So for example, we had patients who suddenly, on monitoring, their pulse rate went from 70 to 80 to 120. The, the nurse called them and said, go to the ER. These people went into asymptomatic AFib. If we weren't monitoring them, probably nothing would have happened. Uh, but our monitoring led some patients to be readmitted. Um, patients loved being in our program. This was actually an interesting takeaway. Some of our patients refused to give us back the telemonitoring equipment. They wouldn't let us into the house. They wanted to keep it. They felt like somebody was watching them. So that's actually a very interesting takeaway uh, to keep in mind. Uh, another takeaway message for us, uh, telehealth was very expensive. Uh, at the time, installing this box with the scale and the cuff and all of that, we, had, we paid rental monthly for these units, very expensive and not reimbursed. Um, and a takeaway mess le lesson to us that was super important is that having a mobile heart failure nurse practitioner was extremely valuable. So having somebody with expertise who did home visits and could go into the home and see patients in the environment where they live um, was very, very valuable for a variety of reasons. And um, towards the end of my talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna evolve to talking about virtual visits and you'll see that in many ways that lesson that I learned back then of being able to see patients in their own home environment is a lesson that we can now carry forward in the era of COVID uh, for care of heart failure patients. Seeing people in their own home really gave us an insight into their psychosocial state uh, that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. Um, and then the final lesson that I'm going to switch to now is that during, uh, as part of our program, we assessed everybody's cognition. And the reason that we did that, it was not my idea. Um, it was my colleague, Steve Landers, who was also a student at Case with me. Uh, you remember Steve? I wrote you wrote him a letter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he also did well. And, um, and Steve actually trained here as an internal medicine doctor and as a geriatrician. And he and I uh, teamed up at the clinic, and I was a junior cardiologist, and he was a junior geriatrician, and we were working together. And Steve said, we should ch check everybody for their cognitive state. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but I'm actually glad I listened to him, and here's why. 
So um, we, um, our nurses assessed, uh, did the mini-cog on every single patient who um, we enrolled into our program on average of about two days before they left the hospital. Here is the mini-cog. So step number one, you ask the patient to memorize three words, like banana, sunrise, and chair. Step two, you ask the patient to, to draw a clock. And here is a clock drawn by a patient admitted to the hospital for heart failure. Um, as you can see, there is a circle. All the numbers of the clock are in approximately the right place, and the hands are appropriately pointing at 20 minutes after 8. And then step number three, um, you ask the patient to recall the words. In this case, the patient was able to remember two out of the three words. So here's how we score this. Um, for every word recalled correctly, the patient gets one point. So in this case, we gave them two points because they got two words, right? And then if they draw the clock correctly, they get two points. If they, they draw the clock incorrectly, they get zero points. So here the clock is correct, two points, two points for, for the words. They get a score of four. A score of between three and five means that cognitive impairment is absent. A score of zero to two means cognitive impairment is present. So a very, very simple tool with a very clear cutoff. Before I go on, I'm going to ask, I'm going to quiz you guys on these clocks, okay? And there's not that many people in the room, so it's just you guys, okay? Uh, here is a clock. Um, this clock is correct, okay? Keep that in mind. So what, what's wrong with this clock? These are clocks drawn by people hospitalized for heart failure and heart care at home, 2011. Right, right. So Dr. Armitage said it looks sloppy, the numbers are correct, and then somebody in the audience said that the, the hands are not at the right numbers, and that's right. So that, 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 this is why this patient failed. We told them 20 minutes after 8, but they didn't draw that. So what's wrong with this clock? We have our numbers reversed. The numbers are reversed. And right. then also uh, very heavily, I guess, uh, on the right side we have all the numbers. They're, they're, they're kind of shifted. Yeah. And then the patient gives up and just writes 20. Okay. What's wrong with this clock? See, so at first you, you kind of smile and you laugh at the clocks, and then you realize these grotesque clocks, these are the patients that we send home with instructions to take 8 to 10 medications, 2 liters of fluid, salt restriction, come back and see us in 7 days and then 30 days, follow all these complex rules. And here we are at heart care at home. We're monitoring their pulse. And we're surprised why we can't reduce readmissions. Who are we fooling here? What's wrong with this clock? So, so th th this, is, this is a dilemma, my, my friends, and this is why hard care at home failed. We were completely focused on the wrong thing. We took all this data and uh, we analyzed it, and we looked at 720 patients who were hospitalized in our program between 2012 and 2013. Um, of, the, of these 720 patients, nearly a quarter met criteria for cognitive impairment in the hospital. So very, very eye-opening. A quarter of the people that we send home after admission for heart failure go home and they're cognitively impaired. And then we looked at their outcome. On the y-axis is the proportion of patients. On the x-axis is months with zero is time of hospital discharge, and then one month, two months later, et cetera. The red line represents patients who had cognitive impairment, their 30-day readmission or mortality risk, but primarily, almost entirely driven by readmissions, was nearly 50%. And those patients who were not cognitively impaired had a 22% 30-day readmission or mortality risk. This is hard to read, but I'll summarize it for you. This is a risk-adjusted model. So down here are a variety of variables like ACE inhibitor use and, and aspirin use and smoking. And This dot up here is the Minicog score. So just to give you an idea, and this risk-adjusted model, the Minicog score, that simple zero to five scale was by far the most powerful predictor of who was gonna get readmitted than any medical variable that we usually 
usually look at. And finally, this is an interesting observation I wanted to share with you as well. Um, this, these sets of, of, of graphs stratify whether the patient was discharged home or to a facility, most commonly a skilled nursing facility. And as you can see, amongst those patients who were discharged home, the curves split early, whereby the readmission risk shoots up at two days, while those patients discharged at the facility, the curves completely overlap and then increase at 21 days. And I'm, any, any theories as to why this was happening? Right, so, so a gentleman in the audience here said that people who go to SNFs get their food and get their medications and get, you know, the, the care is provided. And then on average, at least in 2011, I'm sure it's probably the same now, the government only pays for people to stay in a SNF for th three weeks. Miraculously, how they all stay there for three weeks, right? Exactly on the dot. And when the money runs out, they get discharged, and immediately they get readmitted. So the, the hint here, the, so this is, this is called effect modification. So there's effect modification by site of discharge, um, and it suggests that this cognitive impairment, at least it suggests to me, that cognitive impairment lingers and seems to have an effect even three weeks afterwards and maybe even longer. So this was a very kind editorial written at the time about our paper saying, uh, and the title I think says it all, Assessment of Cognitive Impairment, the Holy Grail of Risk Prediction. So. It, to date, I am not aware of any single freestanding single variable that can predict readmission risks more strongly than cognition. And this is also a free tool. There's no fancy equipment. There's no catheters and stents that we love in cardiology. It's just, you know, you need a piece of paper and a pen. So let's dive into this uh, a little bit more. The, the mechanisms of heart failure-induced brain injury, also called the cardiocerebral syndrome, are not entirely known. This is a graphic from a review paper published a few years ago uh, looking at the cardiocerebral syndrome, and it may be related to elevated levels of neurohormones, increased inflammation, reduced cerebral blood flow, low thiamine levels, problems with interrupted sleep. Whatever these mechanisms, they kind of lead to the same thing, which is cognitive dysfunction, including memory loss, and impaired executive function, as well as anatomical brain changes. Actually, if you do uh, MRIs of, of patients with chronic heart failure, you'll see gray matter atrophy and white matter hyperintensities, and all of these things lead to downstream cardiocerebral syndrome. So maybe that's what we were seeing in those patients hospitalized for heart failure who were flunking the minicog. Regardless of why patients with chronic heart failure have cognitive impairment, Cognitive impairment is associated with bad outcomes, which include poorer medication adherence, poor overall treatment adherence, reduced instrumental activities of daily living, worse self-care, increased mortality risk, and as I showed you, also increased readmission risk. Following this observation, um, I remained in, very interested in this along with a group of people that I was doing research with at the time. And one of the things that we observed is that many clinicians are lack familiarity about how to screen for cognitive impairment. I don't know, maybe our, you know, the neurologists know how to do this very well, but certainly cardiologists and probably a lot of internal medicine folks just don't think about this much. They don't know how to screen. So what we did in, in order to try to help clinicians who want to screen for cognition is we invented this uh, double-sided card. And on the front of the card, uh, you have a four-panel cartoon. You have a nurse talking to the patient, and the, and the nurse um, says, you know, uh, please remember these three words, banana, sunrise, sunrise, chair, and then the patient repeats it. And then she asks them to draw a clock. And so it basically shows you how to do the mini-cog graphically. And then you flip the card over, and you have instructions about how to grade the mini-cog uh, with an algorithm about pass or fail. We then tested this card. We, we did a randomized clinical trial, and we enrolled nurses from a variety of floors and outpatient units in the hospital. 
um, who had absolutely no prior exposure to training with a MINICOG, and then we randomly assigned them either to use the standard MINICOG instructions, which are very science-y and multiple pages and kind of confusing, but that, at the time that's the only thing that existed, versus our, versus our card in a simulated session with a mock patient. The nurses that we enrolled on average were 29 years old. Um, a majority were women. Um, a majority worked in inpatient uh, work settings for about four years. Uh, none of them in either arm had ever heard or seen the MINICOG, and 93% in both arms were native English speakers, so we didn't anticipate that that would be a barrier. And here are the results of our study. Nurses who were randomly assigned to use the standard instructions had a fairly high rate of incorrect administration of scoring. Those, pa those nurses who used our card did great. They always could figure out how to administer or score the test. Um, there was a, a uh, very low rate of incorrect administration scoring. It took the nurses about a half a minute to read the card and then about another minute to deploy the test and grade it. And we concluded that using the, these graphical instructions can increase accuracy and speed of test administration. And uh, for those of you who are listening who may be interested in, then in, in using the MINICOG in your clinical practice, this card is available online for free and can be printed out and can be shared with your team members. I'm also quite fortunate um, over the last few years to have worked with the geriatric leadership group in the American College of Cardiology, and we published this paper in 2018 uh, looking at various domains of patients um, who are older adults and are dealing with heart failure. And in this domain here, we encourage clinicians to uh, evaluate cognition and specifically, if impaired, evaluate the impact on self-management skills, which we believe is why cognitive impairment is associated with things like readmissions and mortality. Um, it's, it's those self-management skills that fail, the ability to take medications correctly and follow directions. We think that that is, is a part of the mechanism. Okay. In a few minutes, I'm going to switch to my, the next area um, in my journey, which, uh, which is virtual visits. So. Who would have thought when I became interested in virtual visits two years ago that this would now, I mean, I didn't even know, when you guys invited me to give this grand rounds, I still didn't think anybody would be interested in virtual visits. <laughs> so this is really, really fresh. Um, but I'd like to argue that virtual visits may be a part of the future of heart failure care delivery going forward. So virtual visits uh, connect patients with clinicians over secure video. And this is me in my basement taking care of a patient. You can see he's holding up his pulse sucks to the camera. He has a pulse of 126 beats per minute. A young man with, with cardiomyopathy and heart failure who we're currently evaluating for advanced options. So I've been kind of tracking him from home. But certainly, um, virtual visits have benefits for patients, clinicians, and healthcare systems. I'm going to touch base, touch base on this very briefly. For patients, virtual visits provide access especially when access is difficult, like during a pandemic or even before the pandemic, just getting to a complex healthcare system like ours where they have to park and walk through the hallways with, a, with our NYHA class three to four symptoms and, and figure it all out. Uh, they provide access where otherwise it would be difficult. For clinicians, it's the ability to serve patients and also maintain a visual connection. And I, I would like to argue that maintaining a visual connection with a patient, even if you can't fully examine them, does bring value. And then for healthcare systems, the ability to reallocate resources in times of crisis like ours, or, and to also generate revenue and to support re research efforts are all value adds for virtual visits. Let me share some more examples. Here is a virtual visit that I did with a patient who had a, a defibrillator implanted, and you can see how well you, uh, the scar you know, you can see the scar is healing very nicely. There's no edema. There's nothing leaking out of it. You know, it's a physical exam of sorts. Here's a virtual visit that I did. This was a patient of mine from Michigan, and um, he, um, I, I, I did a virtual visit with him, and then I heard his daughter's voice 
in the background, and he was doing the virtual visit with me, and on another phone put her on speaker, but the, the platform I was using at the time allowed multi-user. So we added her in, I sent her an email and added her into the conversation, and you can see how, how suddenly you can have actually a family meeting with people all across the country and the world who may not be in the same room at the same time. Here, here is a gentleman who lived uh, two streets away from my clinic, but uh, just didn't want to come to it. It was just too hard and too expensive and too confusing to come into the maze. And the reason I'm showing this is because I've been using virtual visits to do medication review and medication reconciliation. And you can see how clearly you can read that lisinopril bottle, you know, five milligram tablets. Not infrequently, I'm able to catch errors by doing uh, virtual medication reviews with patients. Something to keep in mind. Um, this is a patient who was here uh, on Learner who had very swollen legs and had, uh, had a skin infection that was resolving, so we asked him to put his leg up on the table so we could examine it, and we could, we could see that the erythema was improving. Uh, also, really interesting, uh, an ability to do multidisciplinary care. There's me, there's Janice, um, one of our heart failure nurses, so we can replicate kind of what we do in person in clinic by having multiple team members log into virtual visits all at the same time. And finally, there's a rumor that older adults can't do virtual visits. I want to dispel that myth, okay? Um, here's a 90, an 86-year-old lady doing a virtual visit. Now, certainly there are people who don't have the equipment and never will. I completely understand. But I would like to argue that a majority of people do have the equipment and can, and if they can't do it, they probably have somebody who lives with them or in their immediate social circle who can help them. So virtual visits are not impossible, and just because you're caring for an older adult, in my opinion, you should not immediately assume that they can't do it. A lot of things have happened with COVID to now bring down the barriers to virtual visits. Um, the most important things that have happened relate to governmental policy, and I'd like to summarize that very briefly. So first of all, as far as licensing goes, the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, now allows physicians to practice in, in this era of the pandemic to, to practice medicine across state lines as long as you have an equivalent license in the state with which you're interacting with a patient. This now opens the door to doing virtual visits across state lines. Um, before, there were Medicare policies about where the patient could be to do a virtual visit. Specifically, there were policies only related to patients in rural areas. And also, the patient had to be in an initiating site that was a healthcare facility. So you really could only do and be reimbursed for a healthcare visit done if the patient was sitting in another hospital or healthcare facility, which made it essentially impossible. All of that is now gone in the setting of the pandemic. Um, HHS and CMS now allow prescription even of controlled substances based on virtual visits. Before, there was a policy that you could only do virtual visits and be reimbursed if you had an established relationship with a patient, meaning you could never do virtual visits with new patients. That has now been eliminated. And uh, as you probably heard, HIPAA rules have now been relaxed by CMS. Before, ver various virtual visit platforms only very specific ones could be used that fulfilled very specific criteria for HIPAA. All of that now has now been eliminated, meaning the clinicians can use a variety of platforms, even as simple as your iPhone with FaceTime to be able to do a virtual visit with a patient. Now, I don't know if you want to do that because then the patient will be able to FaceTime you whenever they want. But conceptually, uh, that is possible. Here is data. Which, is, which actually um, I up refreshed this morning. Um, I downloaded this from the Commonwealth Fund a blog that they publish, and they get data from a company called Pharesia, P-H-R-E-S-I-A, I hope I'm saying that right, and that is a healthcare technology company, um, and its clients include more than 1,600 providers, provider organizations with more than 50,000 providers. So this is a huge data set. And you can see what happened over the last few weeks, starting in February of uh, 2020 through March and April and now. In orange are the number of visits that 
physicians across the country of all specialties have had. And you can see that at its worst, by early April, on average, physician, physicians were down 70% in the number of visits they were providing. The green line here is all type of visits, suggesting that this delta between the orange and the green are virtual visits. So really, interestingly, starting, and you can even track through the exact time point where this started. Starting in middle of March, where these policy changes were implemented and when we were seeing plummeting numbers of patients coming to our clinics, suddenly the U.S. healthcare system, while not entirely, started embracing this new technology, this new platform of delivering healthcare. So really fascinating. And we can see that now, even as the number of in-person visits are starting to creep up again, there is still virtual visits happening everywhere, suggesting to me that maybe this really is going to be a part of the new norm of how we deliver healthcare. It's going to be interesting to see how this data continues going forward. This is the same data showing now on the y-axis the percent of change in visits from baseline, um, and specifically looking at telehealth visits. So in the, across the United States, somewhere between 12 and 14 percent of visits are happening virtually. So many unknowns with virtual visits. Um, can virtual visits improve adherence? Unknown. Can they reduce the cost of care? Maybe. Can they reduce, decrease no-show rates, improve transitions of care, prevent admissions and readmissions? So those of you listening who are interested in clinical research and virtual visits and models of care like I am, these are questions that need to be answered, and, and we have the ability to now answer them. One question that interested me that I want to share, share data about in the last few minutes has to do with no-show rates. This is a... a a late-breaking clinical trial that I presented in September of 2019, so just uh, a few months ago, last fall, at the Heart Failure Society of America. This was a clinical trial that we did that we called VIVHF, Virtual Visits and Heart Failure Care Transitions. So here's the background. We recognized that missed outpatient clinic appointments, meaning no shows to our clinic, were very common in patients transitioning from hospital to home after admission for heart failure. And um, we, in the literature, it ranges between 50 and 80 percent no-show rates for these patients. Why does this happen? Well, it's complex. Maybe it's inconvenience of getting to the appointment, uh, expense, who knows? But those of us who have joined us for cardiology clinics here at UH know that I'm right. The no-show rate is out of control. It's unknown if virtual visits can help reduce appointment no-show rates. So we conducted a pragmatic, randomized, single-center clinical trial um, with the aims being of, is it feasible to provide virtual visits for patients coming from hospital to home? Um, we wanted to see to what degree virtual visits can reduce appointment no-show rates. And we wanted to see the impact of virtual visits on clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. We included patients who were hospitalized for heart failure as the primary diagnosis. They were planned to be discharged home, meaning those patients who were going to go to a nursing home or to hospice were excluded from the study. They were equally agreeable to either an in-person or a virtual visit, and they must have had themselves or their social circle the equipment and connectivity to do a virtual visit. The primary outcome for our randomized trial were no-show rates at seven days post-discharge, and the clinical outcomes were hospital readmissions, ED visits, and death. Based on our experience at the time, so this was an abstract published in 2017, suggesting that the heart failure clinic that I used to work in had a 76% no-show rate for these patients within the first week post-discharge. So we said, um, we were guessing. There is no published literature on this, so we guessed. So we, we did a power calculation based on a reduction from 76% to 51% uh, in no-show rates. And our plan was to randomize patients in an equal manner, 54 in each arm, we assumed, would give us the power that we needed to answer this question. So between October of 18 and July of 2019, we approached 408 patients. Of these, 292 were not enrolled, and then a small 
amount had to be withdrawn for a variety of reasons. And I should say that only 10% of patients who were not enrolled did not enroll because they lacked equipment. So that, I, I, you know, that, that in itself was, was kind of eye-opening to me. So a lot of patients reported, yes, that they could do this. We, uh, as per our plan, we randomized 108 patients, and randomly 52 were assigned to the virtual visit arm and 56 to the in-person visit arm. So here are the main outcomes uh, of our trial. The no-show rate amongst patients in the in-person arm was 50%. Now remember, in our power calculation, we thought that this was going to be much higher, 71 or 72%. The no-show rate in the virtual visit arm was lower, was 34.6%. So this was about a 15% absolute risk reduction in no-show rates or a 31 relative risk reduction. Uh, the p-value here was 0 0.12. It was not significant, um, probably because our our study was underpowered. We were we, we we did not anticipate that the no-show rates would be lower. And if I had to do it again, lesson learned of doing a randomized clinical trial: put more patients in the study than you think. <laughs> but that was that was a lesson I learned. But I think that I'm showing this to you because I think that the trends are interesting, and I I believe that the trends here tell a story. Um, here are the, the secondary outcomes. Our trial was not powered for the secondary outcomes. And still, interestingly, um, amongst hospital readmissions, there were, there were, we observed lower readmission rates than for those patients randomized to the virtual visit arm than to the in-person arm. Uh, I cannot reach any conclusions. This was not significant. This was not powered correctly. But the first clinical trial usually is you know, there to help design the second clinical trial. So I think that there's some really interesting bits of data there. And I'm gonna end the grand rounds by showing us our own data. So this, this was shared uh, by, by hospital operations here at UH. And you can see a few things here. Um, on the x-axis, it starts on March the 16th and then March 17th, 18th, so forth, all the way until May the 6th. And blue are patients who were arrived in person to clinic, and gray are patients who were no-shows to clinic. You can see that starting in about the third week of March, the number of patients scheduled uh, to show up in clinic drops precipitously uh, related to people's fear and also our behavior internally here at UH. And suddenly the number of virtual visits and telephonic visits shoots up. That's this peach color part of the graph. Gray is the no-show rates for in-person. And these tiny little yellow dots on top are no-show rates for virtual visits. So to me, this is fascinating. And this is also in line with my hypothesis for my clinical trial, suggesting that virtual visits have no, lower no-show rates. And uh, this data breaks it down further to specialty care like cardiology, and you can see that that trend is there as well. So I'm going to wrap it up there and happy to answer any questions, but thanks for listening to my personal journey over the last 10 years of heart failure care transitions. As it turned out, it really has nothing to do with heart failure. <laughs> so um, thanks. That was, really, that was awesome. I think um, you know, time is pretty good for virtual visits, as you said, because we've, we've all been doing this. Um, and I, I agree with you. It seems much more meaningful when you can see the person versus just talking on the phone. It really is. And I've done FaceTime, and I, I can change my um, Apple ID on FaceTime. My question is, um, I was talking to Dr. Harwell, who runs a resident clinic, and she said, well, we shouldn't have any no-shows anymore because if people don't show up, we can call them. And I, I, you know, in thinking about my own patients, if um, if you call them, uh, and, and and they didn't want to see you, and but you're trying to make this a virtual visit, uh, especially if you charge them for this, um, I don't know if you've encountered that. I think it's a neat idea. If people don't show up to the clinic, then you call them, and make it a virtual visit, and a lot of times the patients will benefit from it because you're connecting with them. There is an issue that the patient just decided they didn't, didn't want to see you. And I guess you have to get consent for a virtual visit, and maybe that's the way around it. Um, our, our EMR form says 
verbal consent for virtual visit. I bet a lot of people don't do that. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry to ramble on a bit. Um, one thing I want to highlight is, and that, which I didn't mention in the talk, is that just just as policy changed for virtual visits and telephonic visits in the in the era of COVID-19, reimbursement has changed markedly, markedly, whereby um, Medicare now reimburses for virtual visits, meaning audio-video connection, at the same level as in-person visits. And immediately, multiple commercial insurance companies have followed suit, as well as Medicaid programs, including Ohio Medicaid. Um, and now Medicaid also reimburses telephonic visits at the same level. And all of this is really to encourage, to encourage patients to remain uh, engaged with their clinicians and not show up and, you know, the fear of showing up and, and, and the contagion and, and, and all of that. Uh, I think that your observations are the observations of, of many of us. I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're making this up as we go along. I mean, it's only we're, how many weeks into this? Eight weeks into this? So it's really interesting to see how, uh, what has happened, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this evolves, to be honest with you. Dr. Gordeski, I've got a question for you, and then I think we have a couple in the chat, too. We can get Excellent. to those. Thank you. Um, there's a number of platforms that people are using for, for virtual visits. I guess is there one that's maybe gaining traction or more popular than others? And are there any considerations for HIPAA using the uh, virtual visits as well, using video or anything like that? The, the HIPAA question is easy. So uh, CMS relaxed HIPAA rules. So a lot of the things that we were used to be scared of are not relevant in the pandemic. Um, specifically, the way HIPAA deals with um, with virtual vis with, with virtual platforms is you needed to have certain security things in place, and you needed to have a, a business uh, associate agreement between the virtual visit company and the provider in order to make it. So all of these things are not relevant, but it's probably going to become relevant again in the future. So the first piece of advice that I have is whatever platform you choose right now, just pick the one that's probably going to be good for the future. And FaceTime Dr. Armitage is not one of them. Sorry. <laughs> I like, I like, I'll make a call. I like Doxy.me. But anyway. Doxy.me. So I, I, I also like Doxy.me. Um, so interesting. So there are some healthcare systems that, that, had, pre, uh, that had previously established relationships with virtual visit platforms when, right before the pandemic. And when they entered the pandemic, a lot of these virtual visit platforms collapsed. Like they could not, I'm, I'm hearing reports from my friends around the country, they could not handle the number of users and there was lag and, and they wouldn't give out new accounts. For better or worse, here at UH, we, we did have a, a relationship with a virtual visit platform called MD Live, but extremely few clinicians were, were uh, enrolled. And when the pandemic came, MD Live could not fulfill our request for accounts fast enough. So... Uh, it was very organic here at UH. It was almost like natural selection. Everybody saw the list of what you could use, and people just started picking things. The most common platforms that were picked by our clinicians were Doxy.me and Zoom. People also use the Doximity app, and they use WebEx and, and FaceTime and Skype, but really Zoom and Doxy.me seem to be the ones that most people just naturally gravitated to. I started out with Zoom, which I love, but it's super confusing for patients to figure out how to log on. So Harrington HVI now supports, supported us moving to the professional version of Doxy.me, which has been great for us. What, because it's super easy to use, you send a patient a text message through the platform, they click on it, they see you, it's super easy. What we're gonna choose as a healthcare system, I don't know, we have a robust telehealth team at the system level. I'm very lucky to be a part of it, and we're having these discussions literally daily. What do we recommend to our colleagues? What should we do as the pandemic progresses? So uh, all of these things will be answered soon enough. Just a, awesome. a, a comment. I mean, I, in, in the travel clinic, we used MD Live for about two years, and travel medicine was perfect for MD Live because it was, you don't need to examine somebody, and it was cash, so you didn't worry about insurance. And then we switched to DoxyMe, you know, in ID, and DoxyMe, greater sign, greater sign, greater sign, greater sign, MD Live. Just the ease of use, the waiting room. I hate MD Live. Go on record. I, I think that a lot of people would agree with you, Dr. Armitage. I've got a couple questions in the chat. They can't see this on the screen, so I guess I could read it and uh, you can uh, try to okay, answer the question for us. Here. 
So um, one question is, uh, I was wondering in your clinical trial, uh, what were the primary reasons for refusal to enroll in the trial, and can you suggest approaches to increase patient willingness to engage in virtual visits? Um, in the trial, um, the most common causes were either the usual kind of reasons. People don't want to be in clinical trials. They just don't want to be in research. They don't understand it. They're kind of scared of it. A lot of people were um, afraid that it would lead them to disconnect with their own primary cardiologist or primary care physician. And it's actually partially true within our trial. People were randomized to in-person versus virtual. We, we encourage it to be with, our, with the same team just to try to make it equal. Um, so, so that was uh, another reason. Um, as I mentioned, only about 10% refused to enroll because they didn't have the equipment or connectivity. Um, I, I think that we did this trial, you know, a year and a half before anybody even imagined there would be a COVID. Now that COVID happened and virtual visits are now, suddenly we all do them and we're all comfortable with them, a lot of those barriers are, are probably gone because every doctor now does virtual visits. So I think it's going to, it would be much easier, and it would be, if I had to repeat my clinical trial, and maybe I should, you know, in this era, we should be able to enroll a lot, a lot of patients because now doctors provide it, and it's a standard of care. Another barrier was we, um, we matched the copay between the two arms of the clinical trial. So if somebody had a copay for X number of dollars in person, we also charge it for the virtual visit because we didn't want to introduce that bias between the two arms. So it could have been that maybe the money was a part of it. There's uh, one more question on there for you. Can you uh, comment on how to incorporate pictures taken from virtual visits into the medical chart? Yes. It depends on the EMR that you use. Um, in my prior workplace where we used Epic, I literally did a screen capture of, of clocks or photographs or virtual visits, and I just pasted into the, into the notes. The EM, AEMR here does not allow, allow that, so... We're going to have to come up with technology solutions uh, around that. Well, any further questions from, uh, I guess, our physical audience or uh, those uh, viewing remotely? Uh, if, if there are, you can unmute yourself and ask. <clears throat> yeah. There's some uh, commotion outside, so we'll some probably. Uh, yeah, Thank you so much for the invitation. So I appreciate it. Rob, thank you. Yeah.